There are a number of important debates going on right now about the energy production in South Africa. The biggest one, of course, is the agenda on ending load shedding and the debilitating power outages that have grown in number over the past couple of years. And then, of course, there is the just energy transition agenda to end South Africa's reliance on dirty fossil fuels, most notably coal. But why are these debates so important and which pathway should South Africa follow? Let's take a closer look. South Africa's power utility, ESCOM, is the biggest producer of energy on the entire African continent. ESCOM alone generates 53% of all electricity that is produced in Africa. Its total installed capacity is 52,000 megawatts, which is about two times Morocco's nameplate generator capacity, four times Nigeria's total installed capacity, 18 times the Democratic Republic of Congo's installed capacity, and about 30 times Zimbabwe's total installed capacity. South Africa has more than 52,000 megawatts of nameplate generator capacity, of course, but some of this is owned by private businesses and households. Now, there is, shall we say, a major issue with ESCOM's energy fleet. The biggest share of South Africa's energy comes from burning coal, which, as you can imagine, is very dirty and, frankly, too toxic. ESCOM's 81 coal units, which generates 85% of South Africa's electricity, are responsible for 20% of all CO2 emissions on the African continent. In other words, ESCOM alone pollutes more than all SADA countries put together. South Africa emitted 435 million metric tons of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion and industrial purposes in 2021, and most of this came from ESCOM's coal fleet. Mpumalanga, home of many of ESCOM's generating units, is a global pollution hotspot with extraordinarily high levels of methane. Why is there such a heavy reliance on coal? Well, South Africa is the eighth biggest producer of coal in the world. South Africa's coal reserves are estimated at 53 billion tons. And with the present consumption rate, there's at least 200 years of coal supply left in the country. The thinking has always been that we have this massive asset. Why not use it to power our economy? And that's exactly what the government decided to do, starting from as early as the late 1800s. South Africa's first large-scale power station, the Kimberley Diamond Mine Power Station, was built and generated electricity using steam turbines. Then later came the first major station, the Victoria Falls Power Station, which began operating in 1905. In 1923, the South African government established the Electricity Supply Commission, ESCOM with a C, which later became ESCOM, the state-owned electricity utility. ESCOM with a C generated the power and the Victoria Falls Power Company distributed it. This relationship continued until 1948, when the Victoria Falls Company was absorbed by ESCOM. Prior to 1994, ESCOM had a very narrow mandate. Its mission was to really provide electricity to large-scale commercial farms, mines, steel plants, and the manufacturing sector, and of course, white households. Electricity was offered to the manufacturing sector at rock-bottom prices in order to make South Africa a global mining and industrial powerhouse. The cheap electricity from coal helped create behemoths like ISCO, De Beers, Anglo-American, Arms Corps, and many, many others. At this stage, less than 40% of the country had access to electricity. Black people weren't even counted as South Africans. A number of important trade unions soon emerged from the mining sector, not only for worker rights, but for a truly democratic South Africa. The National Union of Mine Workers, NUM, was founded by President Cyril Ramaphosa in 1982, and the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa was founded in 1987. NUM has given South Africa two presidents, Cyril Ramaphosa and Khalema Mokland. After winning the first democratic elections in 1994, the African National Congress identified access to power as a right to be enjoyed by all citizens. ESCOM was given the mandate to make the dream of affordable, quality electricity a reality. The number of black South Africans who had access to electricity increased from around 5 million in 1994 
1994 to over 60 million in 19, 2019. And the electricity penetration rate went from around 36% in 1994 to over 85% in 2019. That's a major leap forward. If you think about it, the average white family had access to electricity in their homes for over 100 years, whereas the average black family only had it for less than 30 years. But here's the thing, adding that many houses to the grid came at a price. According to ESCOM's 1994 annual report, the utility had 37,840 megawatts of generation capacity in 1994, with 239,457 kilometers of power lines. That year, ESCOM committed to reducing the price of electricity by 15% and connecting 5 million black households to the grid. The World Bank advised the South African government to leave new generation responsibilities to the private sector. President Mbeki commissioned a report, tried to privatize ESCOM before eventually reversing course. But he did not act quickly enough to build new generation capacity. Between 2005 and 2011, ESCOM reopened three coal units that had previously been mothballed to generate 3,600 megawatts of electricity. It also commissioned 1,000 megawatts of new capacity and awarded 1,000 megawatts of generation to IPPs. And the rest is history. There was too much pressure on the grid and low shedding began in 2007. President Thabo Mbeki apologized to South Africans for not accepting ESCOM's timeliest recommendations to build more generation capacity to match the country's growth rate. He commissioned two power, coal power stations, Medupi in Lepalele and Kusile Power near Vidbank to generate 9,500 megawatts of electricity. Shortly after that, he was replaced by Jacob Zuma. Many coal generating units were approaching the end of their lifespan and Mbeki's successor, President Zuma, should have commissioned his own significant build project, but he didn't. He opted for a nuclear capacity of 9,600 megawatts, but a whistleblower outed that secret deal he was negotiating with Russia without following proper awards procedures and he abandoned the project. ESCOM then focused on running its coal fleet with little downtime for maintenance, and that's what led us to where we are now. We genuinely believed load shedding would be a thing of the past by now, but unfortunately, it's only gotten worse. There were 36 days of load shedding in 2019, 52 days in 2020, 48 days in 2021, 200 days in 2022, and every single day in 2023. As you can imagine, this is having a devastating impact on the South African economy. Business output has dropped and GDP forecasts have been revised downwards several times. Black South Africans still bear a disproportionate brunt of load shedding. Without electricity, children in township and rural areas are unable to study after dark or have access to computers or other electronic resources, limiting their ability to learn and develop the skills that are needed to succeed in a modern world. Those who rely on traditional sources of lighting and cooking, such as kerosene lamps and wood stoves, breathe in toxic fumes day in, day out. And this means respiratory illnesses and other health issues like asthma. Basic activities such as cooking, cleaning, personal hygiene become more and more difficult and time consuming, reducing the overall quality of life of individuals and families. Small businesses cannot operate effectively, limiting economic opportunities and hindering development. In today's digital age, access to information is essential for participation in society and the global economy. Without electricity, low-income households are cut off from important sources of information, limiting their ability to participate in the global community. So the question is, how do we fix ESCOM? President Cyril Ramaphosa adopted a number of unprecedented decisions to end load shedding in South Africa. In 2021, he amended the Schedule II of the Electricity Regulations Act, lifting the threshold of, for embedded generation from 1 megawatt to 100 megawatts without needing a license. 
In 2022, Huyen lifted the 100 megawatt threshold completely and indefinitely. The Department of Natural Resources and Energy has approved over 100 independent power producer contracts with a generation capacity of 9,000 megawatts. The provinces are already stepping up to the plate. Construction has already commenced on the Gauteng government's 800 megawatt solar farm in Mirafong on land donated by Sibanye. The Western Cape has announced plans to build as much as 750 megawatts of clean generation capacity by 2025 and then reach 6,000 megawatts by 2035. In KwaZulu Natal, the city of Durban has announced a 324 billion rand plan to build solar and natural gas power stations. The Northern Cape has announced a plan to train workers and enter into partnerships with renewable companies. In March 2023, President Cyril Ramaphosa appointed an electricity czar to oversee South Africa's plan to end load shedding. Electricity Minister Jose Enchu Ramakhopa has announced that his immediate priority is improving the energy availability factor of ESCOM's 81 coal units. He is purchasing replacement parts for some coal units and has called on the government to waive the requirement for the flue gas desulfurization system in some units to quickly bring them back online. This is a highly controversial move. Though many desperate South Africans just want reliable, uninterrupted lights back now, today, removing flue gas desulfurization systems means dumping more CO2 and methane into the atmosphere. People are going to die from this. Kuburg, South Africa's lone nuclear power plant, which supplies 5% of South Africa's power, has always had a reputation for reliability. On April 15, 2023, Kuburg Unit 2 tripped, sending South Africa into stage six load shedding. Kuburg will certainly add to Minister Ramakhopa's sleepless nights. It has a total nameplate capacity of 1,940 megawatts and is vital to keeping the lights on. South Africa's just energy transition. Now let's look at renewable energy in South Africa. As part of the COP26 negotiations, South Africa signed a just energy transition partnership with a group of countries, that is Germany, France, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union to support South Africa's phase out of coal. This was one of the most significant outcomes of COP26. Through the partnership, South Africa would receive $8.5 billion to accelerate its just energy transition plans. South Africa has earmarked Komati's old coal power station as the locus for the project. The partnership money will be used to set up reskilling centers for energy sector workers, as well as initiatives to boost small economies that were built around the presence of the coal mine in the town, in addition to one 200 megawatts of solar power. Now, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, limiting global heating to 1.5 or 2 degrees involves rapid, deep, and in some cases, immediate greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Now you can see why there has been major uproar in South Africa following Electricity Minister Kosi Enchu Ramakhopa's decision to refurbish old coal power stations, import 15-year-old second-hand generators from the Netherlands, and apply for a waiver of the flue gas desulfurization systems to end the electricity crisis right now, but which will cause and lock in massive dumps of CO2 into the atmosphere. This is unacceptable. But at the same time, several things are also true. Trade unions are fully behind Energy Minister Gwede Mandashe's push to hold on to Coav SA's coal energy fees for the next decade and possibly beyond. The thought of losing their jobs is just too frightening. Businesses in towns where there are coal-fired power stations are not keen on the Just Energy Partnership either. They're afraid of losing their sources of income. The coal and allied sectors employ up to 120,000 people. The energy, auto and metal sector employs a further 1 million people. That's a formidable political block. If they are pushed too hard, too quickly into adopting green energy, that could backfire. It could alienate many working families. 
For this reason, the just energy transition has to be, well, just. We need to speak our truth loudly and clearly, but also patiently. Green energy sources are currently saving South Africa from a total blackout. They are getting cheaper every day, and South Africa's international energy partners are adopting tough measures to switch their economies to low carbon or carbon neutral paradigms in the midterm. For this reason, South Africa must accelerate its energy transition or risk losing its most important export markets, the US and the EU. Perhaps it is also important to say that low shedding crisis has inadvertently accelerated the adoption of sol solar and wind energy in South Africa. Prior to 2021, many people were not interested in discussing solar energy or wind energy as serious alternatives. The low shedding crisis in 2022 and 2023 has forced a reckoning and many thousands of South Africans have installed rooftop PVC systems at unprecedented rates. South African households now have at least 1,000 megawatts of solar generation capacity. South Africa, which used to have less than 3,000 megawatts of renewable energy generation capacity five years ago, has doubled that to 6,200 megawatts in 2023. When the construction of the 100 projects that have been awarded in the risk mitigation and renewable energy independent power producer procurement programs are completed by 2025, South Africa will have at least 16,000 megawatts of renewable energy capacity. That is a remarkable transformation. Now, if South Africa continues at that pace, builds the battery storage capacity, as well as over 16,000 megawatts of renewable capacity announced in the Integrated Resource Plan, then South Africa should have at least 30,000 megawatts of renewable energy generation capacity by 2040. This is huge. And inch by inch, we are getting closer to where we need to be, regardless of what the fossil fuel lobby is saying or doing. So there you have it. Low shedding has had a devastating impact on South Africans' economy, with the poor bearing the brunt of the power outages and disruptions. However, the power challenges have also helped to accelerate South Africa's renewable energy push. It's all hands on deck, as different stakeholders rush to build new green energy generation capacity. And that is something that we must celebrate.